morning. Good morning. Happy Monday. Uh, today we're going to continue on in Daniel, as you might expect. Um, and we're going to pick up the cliffhanger that Brian left for you on Friday. Um, that <clears throat> On Friday he talked about the, uh, the passage where the king um, is having a great feast. And... Um, then all of a sudden there is a, a, a hand writing on the wall, which is very weird, and um, writes some words and he's very terrified and he wants to know what it means. So all weekend, I'm sure you've been wondering, what does this mean? Yes, I'm sure you've poured all of your thoughts this entire weekend. <laughs> hey, I don't know. I mean, you could also read ahead. It's not really like we're saying a new story. It's been here this whole time. But anyway. Well, let's pray. Uh, dear God, thank you for uh, your word give to us. Uh, Lord, thank you uh, as we're going through Daniel and you're showing us how you've interacted with these uh, these kings, first uh, Nebuchadnezzar and now Belshazzar, as uh, we see how you are uh, you are a, you are king of all and then that no one is above you. Uh, Lord, I pray that we continue to see more of your character as we read uh, through Daniel. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, so we're going to be reading Daniel 5, um, starting in verse 17 to the end of the chapter, which is, if I can 30. turn the, oh, my page isn't turning. Okay, 2.30. <clears throat> so, uh, Daniel 5, um, it's starting in verse 17. Then Daniel answered the king, You may keep your gifts and give your rewards to someone else. However, I will read the inscription for the king, and make the interpretation known to him. Your majesty, the most high God, gave sovereignty, greatness, glory, and majesty to your predecessor Nebuchadnezzar. Because of the greatness he gave him, all peoples, nations, and languages were terrified and fearful of him. He killed anyone he wanted and kept alive anyone he wanted. He exalted anyone he wanted and humbled anyone he wanted. But when his heart was exalted and his spirit became arrogant, he was deposed from his royal throne and his glory was taken from him. He was driven away from people. His mind was like an animal's. He lived with the wild donkeys. He was fed grass like cattle and his body was drenched with dew from the sky until he acknowledged that the most high God is ruler over human kingdoms and sets anyone he wants over them. But you, his successor, Belshazzar, have not humbled your heart, even though you knew all this. Instead, you have exalted yourself against the Lord of the heavens. The vessels from his house were brought to you, and as you and your nobles, wives, and concubines drank from them, you praised the gods made of silver and gold, bronze, iron, wood, and stone, which you not see or hear or understand. But you have not glorified the God who holds your life breath in your, his hand and who controls the whole course of your life. Therefore, he sent the hand, and this writing was inscribed. This is the writing that was inscribed, Mene, Mene, Tekel, and Parsis. This is the interpretation of the message. Mene means that God has numbered the days of your kingdom and brought it to an end. Tekel means that you have been weighed on the balance and found deficient. Peres means that your kingdom has been divided and given to the Medes and Persians. Then Belshazzar gave an order, and they clothed Daniel in purple, placed a gold chain around his neck, and issued a proclamation concerning him that he should be the third ruler in the kingdom. That very night, Belshazzar, the king of the Chaldeans, was killed, and Darius the Mede received the kingdom at the age of 62. Yeah, so, right off the bat, starting in verse 17, uh, but actually even slight, slightly before 17 kind of explains why verse 17 even had to exist um, is that the king has offered to essentially pay Daniel for this interpretation and Daniel kind of declines the payment but we can kind of notice that it seems to be a slightly different relationship between Daniel and Nebuchadnezzar and Daniel and uh, Belshazzar because we don't really see that when Daniel is interacting with Nebuchadnezzar we don't see the king just I mean, the king does reward Daniel, but we don't ever see the, the king just trying to buy uh, Daniel's um, uh, interpretation. Uh, Daniel, usually he freely gives it. I mean, even the one time when they were coming to kill him, 
<laughs> he says, uh, actually, I can try to interpret it for you. Just give me some time. Uh, but we see here, um, at first, the king, if we, if we go back and recap a little bit, the king doesn't even remember Daniel. Yeah. The, the queen has to remind him about Daniel and say, hey, there's this, uh, there's this guy that your predecessor used to use. Maybe you should go talk to him. So it seems like uh, that there's a different relationship between Daniel and Belshazzar than there was with Daniel and Nebuchadnezzar. So that's kind of the, the starting point as, as Daniel's coming in to, to share this interpretation uh, to Belshazzar. Um, so we see he declines the gifts, and then he goes and kind of rebukes him before he even gives the interpretation. He gives uh, this rebuke to the king uh, and, and shares about uh, Nebuchadnezzar. He shares about the king's predecessor, Nebuchadnezzar, and says, here's how great Nebuchadnezzar was. Uh, the most powerful man in the world, yet he eventually acknowledged God. Mm -hmm. um, and he says that you knew this. You you knew that this was a thing, yet you did not acknowledge God. Mm -hmm. So he doesn't go straight into an interpretation. He first rebukes the king, and then he interprets what the writing has to say. And so this has <laughs> got to be pretty hard. He's about to tell the king that uh, his, he, his end of days. Uh, that his kingdom is going to be brought to an end, uh, that he is um, deficient, so he's not good enough, and that his entire kingdom is going to be given to someone else. So those are the things that Daniel is about to, to say to the king, and he doesn't, he doesn't really hold back. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think um, <clears throat> when he, he's first explaining, um, kind of reminding him, hey, remember Nebuchadnezzar before you? Remember what he, how his story ended? Um, I think it's almost necessary for him to kind of hold up the mirror to Belshazzar and show him, like, do you, do you see how you're not actually that great? Um, he had to, like, set the scene and set the context so that the meaning and the interpretation of this writing on the wall, um, like, he understood why it was and how important it was. That I think if he had just said, oh, yeah, the, mean the writing on the wall says that you're going to be overthrown... Or you're like you're gonna your kingdom's gonna be divided and you're done. It I don't I don't think he'd understand why or he wouldn't know or it would be harder for the king to maybe even accept it as that Daniel was telling the truth uh, because he's in the, he's so prideful. Like when we um, like on Friday, Brian was describing the the scene of of he's this, feast. this yeah this feast and they're just drinking and drinking and drinking thinking they're so great and just honoring themselves um that you just tell someone i mean it's like i feel like it's like on the schoolyard if you got a bully who's thinking he's the greatest and you go up to him and say like you're gonna get beat up one day they're like mm -hmm, mm -hmm, sure okay but if you but he had to show him that somebody who was greater than you was shut down by the lord and really humbled so who do you think you are like do you remember that like don't how did you forget that and i think that's another um yeah. point that um as i was reading the first first part of this chapter what what we did on friday like you kind of start to think like how did this guy not why how do you not remember what just happened in nebuchadnezzar like that was a big deal and he's the one who comes after him wouldn't he be aware of this but it seems like he doesn't care or he doesn't he thinks he might be better than nebuchadnezzar yeah <clears throat> and so we, we just kind of answered the question now you know why include this little this little monologue that David had sorry Daniel had before telling the, the the interpretation and so I think I think that's why is to set to set the scene of like how how badly the king had transgressed given his past mm -hmm. and so I think it also talks to um, <clears throat> how God judges uh, Nebu he judges Nebuchadnezzar and Belshazzar differently. Nebuchadnezzar, he lost his kingdom for a time. Um, he was he was cast out into the wild to live with animals and feed on grass and stuff. But once he acknowledged that God uh, was Lord of all, then, then he regained his kingdom. So it was restored to him. And that is because that he didn't know beforehand uh, that God was Lord of all. Uh, this, this trial, this test taught him that God was Lord of, of everything. Uh, but Belshazzar had the luxury of already knowing that. He, he saw 
what happened to his predecessor. Um, and Saul that Nebuchadnezzar uh, acknowledged the Lord, uh, like acknowledged the Most High God. And so God judges Belshazzar more harshly because he was supposed to have known already. Uh, Daniel says, uh, but you, his successor, Belshazzar, have not humbled your heart, even though you knew all this. So he had known everything that happened to Nebuchadnezzar, yet he still didn't humble his heart and acknowledge God. And so his judgment was much harsher. He was he lost his kingdom. It was handed over to the Medes and the Persians, and he died. That very night after the interpretation, he died. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't. I don't know if I have any other thoughts on it. Like, um, uh, do you have any other thoughts? My brain just kind of stopped. Sure. I guess. What could that mean for us? <laughs> or, as we read this. Yeah. Um, um, yeah, I think, um, something that's really, well, can I not answer that question? Sorry, I actually read this. Okay. Um, it's a Monday morning, y'all. Um, I think it's interesting he's, uh, he points out to Belshazzar that, like, you have not honored the Lord, and instead you've actually used these vessels, the, the things that were taken from the, the Israelites and put into the house of Nebuchadnezzar and his God. That was from way back the beginning of the book. Um, and he's saying, well, you're just using them for you and your wives and your concubines to like drink from, to actually use. Um, and, and you praise the gods of these other elements, silver, bronze. Um, but he contrasts that with you have not glorified the God who holds your life breath in his hands and who controls the whole breath of the whole course of your life. That um, I thought that was an interesting um, way to describe these other gods and the way to describe God, um, that they might, the other gods they were serving, that they're just, they seem to be these gods of just these elements, but God is the one holding your life breath. Like, if you compare that as another element, like, that is so much greater. And, like, the Lord is not just there for to give you some silver or to like make the sun to shine he's the one that gives you life and breath um and that is the god that he he describes the lord as that way as the one who he has disobeyed um which i think makes sense then um and kind of gives god uh the like how can god be the one to judge him or to be the one to write this on the wall and it's because he is the the god of your life breath so i think we can read this as like i don't want to say like cautionary tale for us because it's more than that because it's not just a tale it's like real um <clears throat> but to see the the when we really know the Lord, like it said, like even though you knew all this, if you know the Lord and you know the um, who the Lord is and how he is judge over all and what he has done for you and for others and how he has shown his mercy and grace and you just totally ignore it and don't take God seriously because that's really what he's doing is not taking God seriously. If he's not taking God seriously, then um, if, if that's where you're at, like, this is what is deserved. Uh, it seems that God, God seems to judge harder um, those who, who know the truth, um, like what the, what the actual truth is, as opposed to we see Nebuchadnezzar didn't really know, but God humbled him and taught him, and then he, he acknowledged the Lord. Uh, but he seems to be judging those harder who actually know the truth and then actively rebel against it. Um, and I think another theme, uh, including that, is is this theme again of God uh, is ruler over human kingdoms and sets anyone he wants to rule over them. Mm -hmm. And that, so there's a contrast from the first uh, section of verse five that Pastor covered last week, where um, the queen comes, he comes, she comes to the king and says, may the king live forever. Uh, she, that's, so that's what she says to start her, her chat with him. And then we see at the very end, it says, that very night, the king of the Chaldeans was killed. 
So a, a very stark contrast to, to the queen saying, king, live forever, and then he dies right after the, the interpretation. And I think that is further driving this, this theme that God is ruler over, over the human kingdoms and sets anyone he wants to rule over them. Uh, so I think that contrast further drives the point of this theme that God is in control over all the human kingdoms. The queen is saying, king, live forever, but God had other plans. Mm -hmm. uh, instead, he, he ends the king's life and puts a new ruler in, in charge of the kingdom. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I'm intrigued by the, the words that were chosen um, for the interpretation, but I don't know enough about, what is this, Hebrew? I don't know enough about Hebrew to really speak to that, so if anybody has thoughts on that go for it um, but yeah so I guess the next question is where do, where do we see Christ so you know God has set Christ ruler over all mm -hmm. um, he sits at the right hand of God and is and, and is ruling over all mm -hmm. uh, so I think that's I think that's where we see we see Christ is uh, ultimately uh, God has chosen Christ mm -hmm. to be to be ruler of the kingdom well, I think we also see Christ in here, particularly in verse 27, when he's describing the the use of how the word tekel was written, means that you have been weighed on the balance and found deficient. That really, for each one of us, we have also been weighed on the balance and found deficient. Like, no matter if you're, if you're hearing this and you're like, oh yeah, cautionary trial, I need to honor the Lord. Like, no matter what, we are all sinful and we are all found deficient before mm -hmm. the Lord. Um, we cannot... Um, serve him perfectly and do it well um but christ has been weighed on the balance and found sufficient for us um christ is the one who lived perfectly and so his measure um of his judgment um is deemed not guilty and he gives that to us um through the cross his death on the cross was for us he stood in our place and um allowed us to also be deemed not not guilty um so i think that's really uh yeah humbling also to to see that not not like nebuchadnezzar was humbled by being put in such a lowly place and his pride was really like put in check and he was humbled but um mm -hmm. it's humbling to see what christ would do for us that we totally deserve the same exact thing that belshazzar received like we, we i think it's easy to read things like this and be like, i'm so much better than that i wouldn't do that i would totally listen but like we do deserve exactly what he had we should like be know that god has numbered our days and is bringing our little kingdoms like we talked about that last time um to an end but he doesn't he has not because christ has stood in our place and we will be exalted and glorified in in heaven uh, because of Christ. Yeah, I like what you said about, oh, it's easy to think that I would never do something like mm -hmm. that or that I am better than King mm -hmm. uh, Belshazzar, but I, I, why would God include that in his scripture to us if, mm -hmm. if, if we're like, if we didn't struggle with these kinds of things, mm -hmm. you know? Why, why even give us this whole section about how King Nebuchadnezzar submitted to the Lord, yet um, Belshazzar didn't. Why even include that if it wasn't a struggle, a thing that struggle that humans struggle with? Um, so, yeah, it's just an interesting question of when we're feeling a certain way that uh, I, I would never do such a thing, or I'm better. You know, why would God even include it in the Scripture if some if people didn't struggle with? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I um, I think though. I don't think any one of us listening to this, um, unless we've reached that viral point, but um, none of us are, are kings or queens over a nation and can say who we want to die and we can say who gets yeah. gets good things. Like None of us have that, but we, we still can believe that we know better and we can be in control yeah. and we can choose how um, we can be rulers of our own lives and say, well... That's nice, God. I remember that time when you taught me that lesson, but I'm going to try doing this again 
but I'm gonna do it the I'm gonna try and do it this way. Yeah. Um, or yeah, okay, that might have worked out poorly for somebody else, but I think I can I can avoid that. Um, I've done that a lot. <laughs> Yeah, and if we uh, ex extract kind of like what the principle is, mm -hmm. uh, I'm sure many people can identify, can, um, uh, what's the word? I don't know. Can, uh, many people can, you know. Relate. Relate, that's the word I was looking for. Many people can relate to it, is that if we extract the principle that uh, knowing the truth, but actively rebelling against the truth, like, um, Mm -hmm. King uh, Belshazzar is here. I think a lot more of us can relate to that mm -hmm. that principle of knowing the truth, yet actively rebelling against mm -hmm. it. Yeah, yeah. So, well, we're actually running out of time. So, <laughs> I would love to hear your guys' thoughts. Uh, you know, write down in the in the comment section uh, uh, any thoughts you have. I'd be curious to know if that resonates with you. That mm -hmm. like knowing the truth, but just wanting to rebel against it. Like you know God, you know that he, you acknowledge him as um, like Lord over all, yet in your heart you just want to rebel against that. Um, I know it's a struggle for lots of people, myself included. Uh, so yeah, let me hear your thoughts. Let me hear what you think about that, that principle we kind of extracted out of here. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and I think the, the remedy even to that is that when we do find ourselves wanting to do what we, uh, knowing the truth and wanting to do the opposite, that we can still set that before the Lord and turn to the Lord, just as Nebuchadnezzar did, um, unlike Belshazzar, who did not. But um, yeah, I guess that's where we can take this, and I'll, I'll just quick close this in prayer. Uh, dear Lord, we thank you for, um, for this day. We thank you for the opportunity to read your word um, and to learn from those who have come before us um, in how they have sought you, Lord, or have not sought you. Uh, Lord, would you uh, help our rebellious hearts today and this week and beyond? Um, would you help us to um, really submit to your will and your ways? Um, keep us from the temptation of thinking that our we know best, um, even when we know your truth or even when we, we know what um, what is truly good in your eyes, Lord. Would you keep us from rebelling in that way? Would you keep us from um, our pride um, and arrogance? Lord, we all struggle with it in some way. Um, we really do, and we just need you. Lord, we praise you for Christ who has stood in our place and ultimately humbled us and has given us new life in you. Would we rest in that and um, trust in Christ and trust in you? Uh, Lord, would you bless all those who are listening today um, and uh, help us to serve you well um, in whatever we may be doing. I pray all this in your name. Amen. Amen. Have a great day.